Right, welcome everyone to King's College London's 2018 Annual Education Lecture. My name is Beatrice Chepek reed I'm the head of the School of Education, Communication and Society here at King's. In a moment, I'll pass over to David Laws to deliver our annual lecture. And then we'll have a response from Professor Meg McGuire, and then we'll have some questions and answers as well. Just before that, I'll say a few words of housekeeping and then just a couple of words of introductions as well. Housekeeping, three things really. Photographs will be taken, as you can see, throughout the event, and they'll be used in our publicity and also in possibly in King's future publicity. So if you, would, if you don't want to appear in a picture for those purposes, please uh, let the team know. Fire, we're not expecting a fire drill, so if there is a fire alarm, could I ask you to vacate this room through the rooms at the back and then congregate in the courtyard just outside this building as you're walking straight towards it. And then finally, we, uh, we tweet, uh, we have um, our Twitter handle is Kings ECS, and the event hashtag for today is hashtag ECS Laws. So if you wanted to tweet, that would be great. I joined Kings last September as head of school, and I'm very proud to be part of a school with such a long history of excellent research in education, but also such a proud history in initial teacher education. Our school's mission is to work for the public good through research and teaching focused on education. And we think about education in its broadest sense, teaching and learning in formal and informal contexts, personal growth and development, and the enhancement of social, civic, and professional capability and engagement. ECS has a proud history of contributing to public policy debates and the concern of professional communities of practice across multiple sectors. And our contribu contributions to those debates are always backed by rigorous interdisciplinary academic research. You can read more about our school on the flyer on your seats. We hold this lecture every year, and we've been very lucky to have a number of truly excellent speakers, and this year is no exception. Uh, we're extremely delighted to have David Laws as our speaker for our annual lecture this year. David Laws is Executive Chairman of the Education Policy Institute. The EPI is an independent research institute that promotes high quality education outcomes regardless of social background. Prior to this role, between 2010 and 2015, David served at the heart of the coalition government as Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Schools Minister and Cabinet Office Minister. As schools minister, David was responsible for a wide range of policy areas, including all capital and revenue funding, the pupil premium, accountability and policy on teachers and leadership. He's continued his passion for education outside of government with his role at the Education Policy Institute. So please join me in welcoming David Laws to the stage to give the King's College London 2018 Education Annual Lecture. Professor Reid, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to give this lecture and thank you for your kind introduction uh, this evening. Usually on these occasions, uh, these days, as you uh, suggested at the beginning of your comments. When I speak on education, I'm usually speaking with my Education Policy Institute hat on. Uh, and some of you, I hope, not all of you, will have heard of EPI, which was established a couple of years ago. And we did so with the aim of creating, in the education policy space, an institution which would have a similar role and function to that which the Institute for Fiscal Studies has in the fiscal and tax policy space. In other words, an organization that's highly quantitative in orientation, is producing high quality research work based on uh, statistics and rigorous analysis to, but to inform the current policy debate and to be nimble enough to switch resources when we think it's necessary to look at policy debates that suddenly emerge from the political process, not that we want simply to be uh, pursuing uh, the political process and obsessions throughout, through wherever they may be in the electoral cycle. On this particular occasion, though, I'm going to speak without my uh, usual hat on, 
uh, or perhaps wearing four different hats, uh, depending upon your uh, perspective, because Professor Reed has asked me to speak this evening not about one specific area of uh, research or policy making and education, but about the interaction between uh, research, evidence and evaluation and the policy making process. And that's not something that EPI uh, has researched and it's something that I wanted to um, come at, if you like, from my background perspective of, four, of having four different roles really in education policy over the last decade. The first being as a spokesperson for one of the opposition parties, the Liberal Democrats in Parliament, uh, where I became the spokesperson on education back in 2007. Then uh, the role that Professor Reid mentioned as a minister in the coalition government, uh, particularly in the DfE between 2012 and 2015. Uh, also, uh, my new role on the sort of, if I can put it this way without offending my former DfE colleagues, the sort of rigorous data-led uh, side of things at EPI, but also with the fourth hat on of another organization that I chair today called the Education Partnerships Group, which is based just down the road in Kingsway, not far from here and which seeks to uh, support governments in some of the poorest countries in the world in improving their education systems, particularly through improved accountability and public-private partnerships. And I want to draw on all of those bits of experience to uh, talk about some of these issues today. And my case, in a sense, is that we need to significantly uh, strengthen the connections between research and evaluation on the one hand and policy making on the other. And I want uh, throughout this lecture to cover three broad areas. Firstly, to talk about some of the things that I think are going right and that are worth acknowledging in terms of the progress we're making in connecting high quality research and policy making. Secondly, to talk about the existing very considerable challenges here and probably in many other countries in making sure that policy making is based upon evidence and not uh, ideology or hunch. And then I also wanted to finish off by uh, saying a few things about how we might address these gaps between the research and evaluation world on the one hand and the policy making world on the other. Very embarrassingly, um, and realizing that my former highly rigorous policy advisor from the DfE, who's also one of the few with an academic background, Tim Loinick, would be in the audience tonight, and I saw him arrive somewhere early on. I checked my speech when I finished it to make sure that it was all itself rigorously evidence-based and quantitative and discovered that it wasn't at all. Uh, because what I'm commenting upon is not discrete areas of policy that we've researched, but actually the process of how policy, uh, and, uh, on the one hand, connects with research and evaluation. That's not something that we've actually researched as the EPI, and I'll get in trouble with not just Tim, but my colleagues at the EPI if I start making a whole set of very firm uh, proposals and conclusions uh, based on something that we haven't actually studied. So I'm offering you these observations um, not just with an EPI hat on, but particularly with an ex policymakers hat on and with some perspective from uh, some of the other countries abroad. And maybe it will be for some of you involved in uh, education research and some of you interested in the interconnection between the policymaking world uh, and research and evaluation who will go off and test some of my propositions and figure out, figure out whether I'm continuing to default to my old political tendencies of basing things on hunch and ideology or whether there is a firm uh, evidence base for some of the suggestions that I'm about to make about the challenges in this area. But before I go on to be too uh, critical uh, and about the connections between high quality research on the one hand uh, and evaluation and the policy making process. I want to just draw attention to some of the uh, good pieces of progress that have been made in this area, uh, particularly in this country over the last few years. Firstly, I think it is undoubtedly the case that there are lots of individual pieces of research in education which actually have been quite influential in percolating through from the research and academic environment into the policy debates that take place in the DfE and in, uh, and in Parliament itself and in all the other policy making organs of government. Yesterday actually the EPI uh, held a conference in London uh, on the issue of the sort of new school landscape that we have in England over, the, over recent times with the development of academies and free schools and regional school commissioners. And at the beginning of that we had one of our research staff present the conclusions of some 
work that he's done to assess the performance of multi-academy trusts in England versus local authority groups of schools and to compare the best performing maps with the worst performing maps using a really uh, rich um, area of analysis that allows us to make intelligent comparisons rather than making crude comparisons that would, for example, penalize a school's group that was taking on loads of challenging poor performing schools and who, if you use the wrong metric, would suddenly look as if it was itself underperforming. And that research, which you can see alongside all the other EPI reports on our website, was really interesting in exposing what might be obvious to you but hasn't been obvious to many policymakers for a long time which is that there is a massive divergence of, perf of performance, both between uh, the highest performing maps and the lowest, between the highest performing LAs and the lowest performing, and that actually um, some of the best performing local authority groups of schools are performing at a far higher uh, rate in terms of attainment and progress uh, than uh, many of the multi-academy trusts. And you might think that that's a sort of fairly obvious thing, but until very recently, people in government, particularly on the side that have advocated the changes that we've seen over the last decade, have found it very difficult to acknowledge, it, acknowledge some of the uh, weaknesses in the reform program, uh, have defaulted automatically to assuming, for example, that uh, the academization of failing schools would automatically lead to success. And in my time in the department, and certainly before that, there simply wasn't a serious uh, evidence base that had been collected, nor that anyone within the DfE was trying to collect, that, allow, that allowed us to make these intelligent comparisons. Indeed, it was difficult, and I'll come back to this later, for policymakers to commission research uh, in an area that might uh, expose uh, some of the failures and weaknesses of the reform program that they were uh, responsible for. And one of the interesting things in the debate yesterday is that as well as uh, a wide collection of researchers. We also had the schools minister, we had the head of Ofsted, uh, we had the, the schools commissioner, and none of them, uh, uh, I can recollect, actually challenging the fundamental conclusions of the report. So although the government minister's report was rather more optimistic than the research we presented would justify, actually a lot was taken as established because the this was a quality piece of research which has helped uh, to move the debate on. And obviously I'm not um, suggesting that EPI researchers have an exclusive uh, claim to success in that area. There are lots of other uh, colleagues who you'll be aware of in the uh, research world who are doing great work. And actually uh, some of the, if I'm allowed to mention the LSE, uh, some of uh, our colleagues who we've worked with at the LSE, like Steve Machen and his team, have also done some fantastic work on the performance of uh, academies versus maintained schools. And that path-breaking research has also helped us to make uh, comparisons at a system level. Uh, we also have uh, some uh, policy makers and decision makers who, uh, to be fair to them, are highly driven by evidence and are genuinely interested in it. Uh, we have a chief inspector who has a very strong uh, focus on data and on improving the quality of data, who is used to looking rigorously at data from her previous role as, as chair of uh, Ofqual and who brings into this area, therefore, a greater focus on the research and evaluation base than has sometimes be the been the case in similar organizations in the past. And we've also promoted in, in English education over the last decade or so other organizations which have helped to build up the research and evidence base and the evaluation uh, base about a lot that's going on in education. And one of, in, in a way, the surprising innovations uh, under Michael Gove, who people don't always associate with uh, experts and evidence base, uh, was the uh, introduction of the Education Endowment Foundation in 2010, 2011, at the beginning of the coalition government, which has gone out there and collected an enormous base of evidence uh, looking at individual interventions in schools and sometimes out school, outside schools to see which of those work and which of those don't work. And some of that feeds back to government, but a lot of it is supposed to feed back uh, directly to practitioners. I think it's also worth saying uh, that, at least for the time being, and we hope this will remain the case, England remains a uh, rich and uh, positive environment to look at research questions in education. We gen generally, compared with many other countries, have uh, a willingness for education data to be shared under proper uh, security control 
that means that we have increasingly uh, rich resources that researchers can use to look at all sorts of uh, very detailed questions and to link different data sets up. Uh, it's to the credit of those people in government and elsewhere that they're willing to make those data sets uh, available. We've got to make sure that that remains the case. And hopefully there are many new data sets uh, that are going to open up in the future and many new opportunities uh, for uh, research. Um, I think it's also worth saying, though you may take uh, limited comfort from this, that although it's tempting sometimes to feel that education in this country should have more of the sort of focus on evidence and research that the NHS, for example, has when recommending individual treatments for individual problems that uh, people have. And sometimes researchers uh, look very favorably on the NHS's attitude and medical uh, practitioners' attitudes to research compared with uh, education. Uh, I don't think it's the case, from my experience in government, that the education area or the education department uh, is uniquely inclined uh, to ignore some research and some evaluation. And I was always struck in government by the fact that the Treasury, which usually held itself up as the great uh, tester and evaluator uh, and serious organization that would impose rigor on the rest of government and that would carefully measure costs and benefits, when it came particularly to anything that the Treasury wanted to do itself, cost-benefit analysis, I can assure you, research and evidence went out of the window, as quite often before budgets and autumn statements, short-term political priorities uh, molded uh, decisions on issues such as the right revenue raising rate for capital gains tax and what the relevant uh, top tax rate should be on how student loans should be accounted for in the national accounts, whether to cut corporation tax, and I could go on adding to the list in uh, a way that I won't do in case there's anyone from the Treasury uh, who happens to be in the audience. Uh, but in spite of all of those positive features of the landscape in this country and the connections between research and evaluation, I think that there are also some very major uh, deficiencies. And I'm struck particularly having left uh, DFE and reflecting not only from the vantage point of EPI, but looking at what's happening in many other countries at the extent to which major debates in English education uh, are still not informed by the research base uh, or by the evaluation uh, that is available. And this is particularly striking when we consider that the United Kingdom uh, is um, the country amongst developed countries that probably spends the most or almost the, the most of education of, as a share of our GDP of any country in the world. So we make a massive uh, investment in education, and yet many of the areas uh, in which that investment goes to uh, lack a clear uh, policy research and evaluation base. And it's worth trying to reflect on why that is. And I'm going to go through some of the reasons why I think that that may be a problem in this country. And the first really is to reflect on what it's like often to be in government and where the focus of government is, because many of you may assume that it is on uh, looking at research base, looking at evaluation, trying to figure out on a daily basis how to adjust the policy process to what the latest research is showing. But actually, uh, a lot of government is focused not on uh, connecting research and evaluation with policy, but on the process of implementation. And I remember being particularly struck by this in one of the probably last discussions that I was involved in as a DfE minister, uh, and also a pretty rigorous uh, discussion in terms of data and evidence. And it was as to where we should place our resources to increase the number of national leaders of education who were working um, from some of the best performing schools in the country to improve some of the underperforming schools. And we were looking in particular at why we didn't have enough in certain areas of the country, uh, whether that was because there were too many weak schools in certain areas, whether it was because the Ofsted grading system made it tough for schools in certain parts of the country to be graded in a way that would allow their leaders to be system leaders. And it took uh, my policy advisor, who I mentioned earlier on, to rather po pour cold water on what was otherwise a very high quality and evidence-based debate by mentioning at the end of this whole process that actually all of the discussion that we'd had over the previous hour was predicated on the assumption that national leaders of education did some good in improving other schools, whereas actually the department had collected almost no information on that subject. 
So we were having a very scientific discussion about implementation, but actually without the evidence base to know whether that particular policy intervention was one that was likely to be uh, successful. So too little uh, connection sometimes between the implementation focus of government and the evidence base as to whether particular interventions have worked and are working. The second area that I think we ought to do a lot better on is the extent to which uh, policy is evaluated. Um, and I think that you might assume that in our country with that enormous education budget, with the high standards of education research that we have, with the enormous education uh, community available, that virtually everything that government does would be evaluated to the nth degree. And you might assume that in the poorest countries of the world, education policy interventions would hardly be evaluated at all. And yet, in the work that I talked about earlier in some of the poorest countries in the world, generally speaking, where there are new policy interventions, the extent to which they will be rigorously evaluated is on a much higher level uh, than would be the case for many policies being implemented in this country, and I suspect some other uh, developed countries. Uh, for example, in Liberia, uh, the Education Partnerships Group was working uh, over the last couple of years with the Liberian government, which decided to try to improve school standards in that country by introducing essentially a version of the academies program in uh, Liberia in just under 100 schools uh, in order to see whether better management of schools raised attainment and whether it helped uh, to deal with some of the problems of uh, low teacher attendance and pitifully low attainment. And in that country, which spends 46 million US dollars uh, per year on education. And I will say that number again because you might think I've got it wrong and it should have been a billion on the end of something, but 46 million US dollars on, on schools for the entire country. The partners who have funded that particular um, evaluation of that program have put $1 million, this is not, by the way, the Liberian taxpayers' money, which you may be relieved to hear, but international foundation money, into evaluating whether or not that program is going to be a success, has essentially created a randomized control trial, has sent research out, researchers out across the country, uh, crossing flooded rivers, you know, dealing with all of the climate uh, problems uh, that you get in uh, countries with severe weather, sometimes finding that some of the schools on the government's uh, list aren't actually where they're supposed to be or don't exist. A very underdeveloped country with massive challenges and yet in that country, we've got an evaluation right at the beginning of the process of a, of, of a sort of gold standard nature. And if you compare that to what's happened with the Academy's program in England, which has been going now for, uh, what, probably 16 years, and yet where it's only really over the last couple of years that we've begun to have high quality uh, research and evaluation outcomes, that is a striking difference. And it is actually because in the Liberian example, those people who were funding the intervention, international foundations, insisted on the evaluation. For a lot of this developmental work, as many of you will know, it is a requirement that if funders put money in, there will be a high level of evaluation. But in this country where we don't need to go to external funders, it is, uh, it is the institutions of government that often uh, make these uh, decisions. And often it is difficult for government to want to put in place high quality, rigorous evaluation. Um, after all, it's usually the case in the media that if uh, you introduce a high quality evaluation, it won't show that everything has gone right. And I can remember if we're now in the confession territory, having one discussion in government myself, whether civil servants came to me and said, Minister, we think there should be an evaluation of this particular policy in your area. And I said, why should, you know, having already decided on this policy, why should I spend 300,000 pounds to help the Daily Mail to continue to run their campaign against it? And it is very tempting when you're a government minister to take that type of attitude. And you might think that the civil service would uh, be pushing back against that, and some, of course, do. But institutionally, there is an interest in demonstrating that what government is doing uh, is a success and not always imposing on oneself the degree of challenge that should be there. And, and this means that not only are 
programs having to often not being evaluated quickly enough. So it's taken us far too long, I think, to understand in England what has been working and not working about the Academy's program, um, and actually to understand all of the differences between the early Blair Academy's program, which does seem to have been quite successful, and the later program that, that hasn't been. But also, when you are trying to evaluate and make judgments and research policy changes, looking in the rear view mirror, it's really difficult to design those research and evaluation programs in a way that will tell you what the drivers of improvement actually are. So we know under the Blair Academy's program between 2002 and 2010 that there were these big improvements in attainment. To be honest, we don't really know why. Is it the autonomy that ministers, particularly under the coalition government, talked about? Uh, is it um, because those schools had some handpicked some of the best uh, leaders in the country, often from obviously local authority maintained schools? The truth is we don't entirely know. And good, high quality research and evaluation at the beginning of the, of the process ought to help us not only to understand whether interventions have been successful, but actually uh, why. The third thing that might surprise you about uh, the process of government and decision making in government is that um, it's not only over individual policy decisions that ministers are not always focused on research and evaluation as a priority, but it has a very um, passing, in my experience, um, uh, bearing upon the information that is sent to ministers on a daily, weekly, monthly basis in most departments. You might expect and hope that a lot of your research uh, that you produce is getting through to ministers, that the report, as soon as you've done it, will appear in their red box that they look at at the end of the day and that they'll be sort of looking through it late at night and getting through to the appendices and the annexes to look at all the sort of policy detail. The truth is I can barely remember any uh, research or evaluation that ended up in my red box as a minister. Um, maybe a couple of times when my policy advisor decided to pull out things that he thought would be interesting to me, and that was more an individual decision on his part rather than an institutional one. But the red boxes of ministers in government in this country, and I suspect abroad, are generally full up with answers to parliamentary questions that have to be approved, letters that have to be signed off on, uh, speeches for debates that have to be agreed, uh, briefing uh, papers that have to be read for meetings that are about to take place, and all sorts of the small decisions that occupy uh, the time of government ministers, uh, sometimes much smaller decisions than you might ever th uh, think reach the uh, desks of ministers. I can remember the smallest decision I made as a government minister was to approve towards the end of the coalition government, the transfer of two square meters of land on a school playing field to be used uh, for, to connect two buildings as a corridor. And those decisions require ministerial sign off because of the sensitivity of uh, school playing field land uh, transfers. So ministerial boxes are piled high with implementation and business of government work. They're not really focused on uh, new uh, research, they're not focused on evaluation, and they're often not focused on asking some of the questions that uh, actually good policymakers ought to be asking, questions that don't arise automatically out of delivering a manifesto. So a lot of the policy debate that I was involved in in government over the school funding system was focused on how we could make it fairer across the country. Were we funding particular local authority areas in a fair way compared with other parts of the country? Were the deprivation weightings fair? And all these are things that we commented upon in our manifesto and our program for government. Um, but the truth is that there were some bigger questions, questions about uh, the way in which we fund different phases of education questions about how much money we invest in early years versus higher education, for example. Those much bigger questions, if they're not surfaced in the uh, manifesto proposals of ministers, if they don't enter the program of government right at the beginning of, of the process, uh, then they don't necessarily get inserted in the process of government over time, and there isn't an automatic uh, way of that being achieved. And so it is, therefore, that quite a large part of government policy is evolves not only out of what was originally in the manifestos, and I'll come back to this, which were often framed in opposition with limited resources, but they often come from 
uh, ministerial and policy advisor hunches about things that really ought to work. You may remember before the coalition government started, uh, the Conservative Party advocated the policy of trying to improve the quality of teaching by improving the quality, in inverted commas, of teachers by preventing anyone from having lower, I think, than a 2-1 degree of teaching key subjects, including uh, maths. And then, to their great embarrassment, they discovered that the uh, maths advisor for the Conservative Party, who was being held up as the greatest mathematician in the country, one Carol Vorderman, had actually graduated with third-class honours in mathematics and therefore would not be allowed to teach in a uh, state-funded school. Because, and nobody had bothered to uh, test the proposition that you know, degree class automatically leads to uh, quality uh, teaching. And I was amused, actually, when, when we had pressures on uh, teacher numbers. One of the Conservative Special Advisors came to me later during the coalition government to make the case for easing up these restrictions that his side of the coalition had introduced because it was clear that the evidence base was more from hunch and assumption and probably from thinking about how it would go down in the media rather than uh, anything else. I also reflect on a lot of the discussions that some of us had in government over what should and shouldn't be in the curriculum and the strong degree to which those decisions, not the legitimate ones about you know, how much education, how much funding should go into education, what the core curriculum should be. I think those are legitimate questions for politicians. But um, policymakers also get involved in all sorts of detailed policy decisions about the curriculum, about the qualifications regime, without really having an evidence base to draw upon, other than their own uh, assumptions. And I remember my particular frustrations in dealing with Michael Gove over the history curriculum, whether Mrs. Thatcher should be in it or not, whether various people should be named or not, and also what, um, English, what books of English literature should be required reading at GCSE level. And I remember my frustrations over a weekend reading the latest briefing paper that had come up that prescribed that a 19th century English novel was going to from then on be mandatory for every student who taught uh, English, who, who took English GCSE from then on and realizing that my own set of subjects taken at, at, uh, at English literature would have been uh, impermissible based upon the Secretary of State's diktat and my worthy collection of Chaucer and uh, Othello and the Great Gatsby would suddenly have been found to be inappropriate. And so I raised this on the Monday morning, coming back full of energy and determination to overturn this piece of unevidence based policy making, only to get a message from the uh, from Michael Gove's office, from his private secretary, which said this, the Secretary of State insists, not a good word when you're hoping to get something changed, on this degree of prescription, because the 19th century novel represents the most important period for the novel as a cultural form. This was the century in which the novel became the dominant form of Western literature. A student of English literature who hasn't studied a 19th century novel is like a student of maths who hasn't studied multiplication. And that was the end of that exchange, <laughs> and I had to concede uh, ground. That's only a tiny example of a whole series of decisions that get made in education uh, without often uh, a great deal of uh, evidence base. Um, I think, finally, before I turn very briefly um, to some of the potential uh, avenues for improvement, um, I'd, I'd want to add on one last challenge to all of you and all of those people in the sort of research community, which is that it's sort of easy to do what I've done over the last 10 or 15 minutes and say most of the problem is about the policy-making process and useless ministers and uh, hopeless civil service aligned to all the wrong things. Um, the truth is some of this is also about the quality, timeliness, and relevance of um, the research that's produced in this country. I suspect that not all of the fact that ministers uh, don't see much research and aren't aware of what's going on is due to their own failings. Quite often, there are big areas of education policy where you'd assume there is a strong research base and there isn't. And they're quite, that there are issues where we're spending and allocating large amounts as a country uh, where actually uh, there really seems to be a paucity of uh, of good quality research and evaluation, not just from uh, government, but from the outside community. And we have to be realistic and recognize that um, the policy making and research process in government is never going to be perfect. And part of the answer will be uh, the sorts of publications that I referred to earlier that uh, 
uh, for example, my colleague John Andrews at EPI produced on that performance report about maps and local authorities, where the impetus for proper uh, policy consideration will come from the outside. And I know that probably takes some flexibility on our part as well. Um, a lot of uh, the way in which research is funded requires you know, long peer review processes, uh, long application lags to get money from uh, the foundations that fund that research. When the government in 2016 suddenly put on the agenda uh, a massive expansion of grammar schools in this country and selective education, I remember talking to one of the directors of one of our major research institutes who said to me, you know, I simply can't do what EPI has been able to do because of some of the funding that you get from your trustees and suddenly put research resource into doing some new original research on this area that might help the policy debate in Parliament because I have to have funding for every single thing I do. And interestingly, we're now seeing various reports on uh, the impact of selective education washing up on the shore uh, a couple of years after the debate in uh, Westminster is pretty, well, it's not quite over because there's still the attempt to expand existing grammars, um, but arguably too late to inform the debate that there would have been in Parliament in 2016-17 had Theresa May uh, not lost the uh, general election last year or not, uh, or, or failed to win it, if I can put it that way. Um, so let me just jog through uh, briefly a couple of the um, uh, areas where I think we could be and where government could be seeking to address these problems, if they are problems, and feel free when we move to the sort of open discussion at the end to challenge whether my uh, assumptions are the right ones and whether there is a sound uh, evidence base. We could have, of course, tried to improve the supply and quality of ministers, civil servants, and others who hold uh, senior posts in government. And it's always worth trying to do that, and there are organizations, some of you are looking cynical, but there are organizations like the Institute for Government that uh, helps new ministers and helps minist people who are going to become ministers and tries to apply them more to uh, research and, and to lots of uh, elements of good government. Uh, but we have to recognize that not every minister is, is going to be focused on detailed research. Many do come with their own assumptions and with their own baggage. Many come without any knowledge at all of the areas that they're going to be Secretary of State for or Minister for because they have just been parachuted in in a reshuffle without, um, in some cases, even wanting to do the job. And um, actually, things have got slightly better over the last few years. Under Tony Blair at one point, we were changing pensions ministers every 11 months. That was their average life expectancy. Actually, I think that was the average life expectancy over the whole Blair period in government. And if you can think of, a, of an area of policy that is more in need of long-term uh, long thinking, then do let me know. The pension seems to qualify for it. But imagine the, uh, the, the job of those pensions ministers being shot through within 11 months. Uh, they would barely understand how the pension system operated in 11 months, let alone have a serious uh, reform agenda. Um, but if we look at things that we may uh, more practically impact on, um, from the first of the roles that I mentioned earlier on, I would say that we need to remember that policy making starts in opposition and not uh, in, in government. Uh, I remember back in 2010, the first discussions that we had with civil servants about the pupil premium that's now been introduced in this country. Those discussions were not at the beginning of the government. They were six months out from the general election when civil servants are given permission by the cabinet secretary to sit down with opposition politicians and uh, go through the policies that are likely to be in their manifestos so they are all prepared to implement them. And one of my um, uh, proudest but also saddest possessions at home, which I shouldn't have, is a paper uh, from 2015 entitled Incoming Advice for the Liberal Democrat Secretary of State for Education, which had been prepared for the 2015 general election had there been another outcome. Uh, by the civil service, and which I shouldn't have, but um, have somehow managed, magically got hold of. And this is the civil servants' this very detailed briefing uh, for an incoming Secretary of State, not sort of raising all the issues and challenges and uh, uh, um, all the research base, but simply saying, Secretary of State, these are the commitments that you made in your manifesto. These are the things, by the way, diplomatically, that don't quite add up that you'll want to clarify but also this is how we're going to implement them. And the civil service machine, and I suppose it's rightly thus, 
It's set up to do what ministers want and to deliver the program of government, not to tell them that they're wrong or to draw attention to the latest evidence base. So the quality of thinking by opposition parties is really important, and the resources that opposition parties get for research are pitifully small and often, in my experience, directed at the sort of um, politically sensitive areas that are vote gainers rather than actually thinking about the serious policy issues that you have to implement uh, in government. Secondly, I think that um, we need to try to uh, introduce in government in a more systematic way a stronger commitment to research and to evaluation uh, as well. In the past, there were some departments that did have, I'm, I'm told, uh, very significant research uh, groups, large numbers of staff committed to this, doing work for governments on their existing policy prospectus and also uh, looking at new ideas for the future. I think many of, of those uh, functions have been uh, shrunk over the years. I've no doubt that it uh, has, has uh, been more of an issue in some departments than in others. I had, when I was a minister, a weekly delivery note that reported back on what the department was doing to deliver government policy and highlighted things that was going uh, wrong. It would be a good idea to have, and um, maybe somebody will tell me there was one and I didn't see it, uh, but a weekly or perhaps monthly note that reports on research in education. And actually most ministers would be interested in that. On the whole, ministers do want to do good and they want to be aware of new research and actually they want to have and announce new ideas. And even in a time of austerity, uh, there was always in every budget and uh, fiscal statement when I was in government, even with the enormous deficit we had, there was an enormous demand before every statement uh, from uh, those people at the top of government uh, to have new policies uh, with money attached to them to show that the government had momentum and was doing things about issues considered of importance. So where there are interesting research ideas and where there are solid propositions to follow through on, there will usually be some chance of getting those introduced in government. So a stronger commitment uh, to research, perhaps winding back the clock in some areas, uh, would be welcome, and a stronger commitment as well to evaluation. Uh, in essence, in those countries that I was talking about earlier, the lowest income countries in the world, it's not government that is insisting on uh, money being spent on evaluation. They would far rather that went to the front line of their education systems, and why wouldn't they if you were, only had $45 million to spend on education in an entire country? But it strikes me that we need to think about what the lessons for our country are from the experience of some of these poor countries, where essentially it is the foundations, it's the people funding uh, the uh, programs uh, who insist on the research and evaluation. And in the same way, in this country, I suppose it is essentially the taxpayer rather than charitable foundations who are funding the programs of work that governments introduced. And actually, it's therefore the taxpayer through the organs of government, including the, the mechanisms for holding uh, government to account, which ought to be insisting much more strongly that the default for uh, most programs is that they should be evaluated and in a rigorous w way. And that m might sound wishful thinking, but I think it's fair to say that in many areas of government, governments have introduced far greater scrutiny over the last few decades, the development of the select committee system, innovations like the Office for Budget Responsibility. It is possible for governments, uh, particularly when they're first elected, I've noticed, rather than when they've been there for a while, to impose on themselves requirements which uh, can lead to uh, good uh, governments, governance and good decisions over time. And finally, I think we need a stronger evaluation of policy outside government. We need to protect uh, the access that there currently is to high quality data systems. We need to enhance that over time so further high quality research uh, can be done. Uh, we've got to consider the areas of research in education in particular which are relatively neglected and how we can not only deliver high quality uh, research that informs policy in the medium and long term, but how we can meet uh, the shorter term requirements of government and of the uh, parliamentary uh, process and the scrutiny that's associated with that. And we need, uh, finally, to build on uh, the good work that organizations like the Education Endowment Foundation uh, have put in place to seek to inform school leaders and 
uh, individual teachers more carefully about what works in education. I think there is a real contrast between a lot of the philosophy in education, particularly over the last 10 years, which has been about innovation, doing things differently, seeking to establish uh, what works from different practices in different schools, and what actually happens in the National Health Service, where you don't expect to see a different medical procedure in a different hospital. You expect that hospitals will know what works and what doesn't work, and will pretty much implement a similar policy across the country. Now, as a liberal, I do believe in experimentation and innovation, but the, that should also be with high quality research and evaluation attached to it, so that over time, that research and evaluation helps to drive out the bad ideas and promote the good ones that are going to work uh, to raise attainment. So we spend a massive share of our GDP on education. Uh, we have a right to uh, assume that the education policies will be based on uh, sound research and evaluation. There are many good things that we can draw from our experience in this country over recent years, but in my view, uh, and drawing on my experience, not necessarily of EPI, but of the policy-making role, there is still a long way to go before we have the uh, system of connection between evidence and policy-making that we might wish for in this country. Thank you. From all of us here this evening, and on behalf of the School of Education, Communication and Society at King's College London, I'm delighted to thank you, David, for exploring the role of education research, evidence and evaluation in policy making here tonight at our King's annual education lecture. David explained to us he is now heading the Education Policy Institute, a think tank that was launched last year. And as he said in his lecture, this is a, an institute that's going to aspire to the sort of role that the Institute for Fiscal Studies plays in economic policy. I read an interview, David, that you did with and for Peter Wilby, um, and, and in which you said that the EPI is going to be data-driven, influencing debate by the quality of its analysis and its quantitative skills. You, are, you added in your interview that the quality of education policymaking is poor, according to David Wilby. I don't know if you actually said that word. Um, and the Institute is going to and wants to Im improve education policymaking. Well, I think that from what we've heard this evening, the Institute is already making a critical and informed contribution to the education policy landscape. And I was... I was delighted to hear expressions like, you know, the Institute is going to be nimble enough to move to emergent themes, because I do think that's a, that's a real problem in policy making. Um, and I also believe that the Institute is going to be in a very strong position because of its capacity to network, to get its voice heard. And I think that too is something that's very important that you did speak about in your lecture. I would like to pick out, I could pick out loads of things because David has given us a very rich portfolio from which to discuss. I want to pick out some of the key themes and comments that he's put to us this evening. First of all, but not in that order, he talked about challenges. He talked about the need for evidence and not ideology. He was concerned that sometimes policy is not re research informed and you gave us some good examples in your talk. And I think that one of the interesting things that you said is, uh, is really, I, I would engage and agree with you, that we do need rigorous policy evaluation in this country, and I don't think that we've really attended to that. We do policy research, we don't often follow up with absolutely rigorous evaluation. And I think, as in the Liberian case that you mentioned, this does need to be more built into the work that many of us are doing. Second point that you made that I, that I was interested in that I'm going to pick up on is you talked about the gap between evidence and evaluation and policy make, and the evaluation in the policy making world. And I do think there is that gap there, but I think that it begs a number of questions. It's not as simple as going out, getting the data and making things happen as we all know. Um, it's a little bit more complicated and there are key questions for us in the research world to think about. What counts as a firm evidence base? And we need to interrogate that question together, all of us who want to make education better. Even though there is evidence, there's always contra-evidence. 
There can be problems in terms of what gets used and counts as evidence and what doesn't. So these are questions about what counts as research. And I'm thinking here about the Clackmannisher study that's been used to fuel um, synthetic phonics, and it's a very, very small study. Um, I also think that um, the third thing that I've taken from what David said is it's, it's a very gossipy thing. It's always lovely to hear the inside story from people who've been there in the room when the decisions were being made, when policies were being decided upon. And I thought uh, what David said was very honest. He said that he thinks that research needs to impact key governmental level policymakers a, a lot more. And I think that's something that can be worked on by people, for example, you said LSE, but also here at King's and your institute. I think that there's a space there for us to be working on impact far more powerfully. I also thought what was very interesting that you talked about in terms of an insider story was that sometimes wicked policy problems may be missed because they're not addressed at, at the right time. I thought that was very interesting. I have also, say David, along with everybody else present, I was heartened by your comments about things going right, and I know you started with those. A lot of research has influenced policy, and I think it's very interesting in the examples that you offered us tonight, that the reform agenda is, is being tackled, it's being opened up for scrupulous, rigorous, intellectual teasing out because people are asking questions about reforms. And I think that your grammar school example is a really good um, uh, issue that, that you, you've dealt with. I also liked what you said about England being rich and in a positive environment for policy sharing and for data sharing, and that really is the case. We are, we are, we've almost got too much data, I no, 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 sorry. <laughs> and the third thing that I was very heartened that you said was that policy making starts in opposition and not in government, and therefore there are spaces for interventions and people are looking for good ideas, and I, I thought that was very heartening. Many of us have been downloading and reading the report by Tony Greeney and, and, and Rob Hyam this week, um, and one key finding was that school leaders regularly feel incentivized to prioritize the interests of their school over the interests of particular groups of usually more vulnerable children. Many um, leaders have said that they see the contemporary policy framework as problematic, and I'm now talking about those who enact policies in schools, not least because, as they say in the report, of the incentives that schools have to act selfishly in a highly regulated market. There was also a review, uh, a prevailing view in the report, and this is a State of the Nation education report, that the system has become increasingly incoherent. So there's a great deal of work for the EPI to do. One of the things that David worked to address in education in his time in Parliament was to ex extend inclusion for all our children, and I think that's to the, the credit that you, you try to keep those agendas social justice agendas on, on, on the horizon. And now you're a gamekeeper turned poacher. With all that knowledge of what really works, it will be fascinating to see what the EPI will do next. One thing I'm sure that we're all agreed on, taking from Weingarten, is a rich, robust, well-resourced public education is one of the best routes out of poverty and a pathway to prosperity. In finishing my vote of thanks, I'd like to say we're all grateful to David for his robust, and it was a robust and an erudite contribution this evening. And I now ask this audience of education policymakers, policy workers, researchers, and policy enactors in schools to join me in expressing its appreciation to David. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you very much, Meg. Thank you very much, David. Um, rather than responding immediately to any of the things Meg said just now and making it just a dialogue, we'd like to open this up now for questions from any of you that you might have um, to David, maybe inspired by some of the things he said today or maybe inspired by some of the comments that Meg made. So we've got two students at the back who have got microphones. I'll just ask you to put up your hand so we can 
hear your question. All right, so let's start with a question in the third row here. All right, gentleman in the white shirt. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, David, it's a question about uh, the skills and knowledge of those involved in policy making. And you mentioned the idea that there could be ways of getting research um, in front of ministers uh, more. Is there a way of improving the general quality of debate in Parliament? Because quite often the minister isn't the problem and the decisions that can be made by a bunch of collective amateurs aren't always necessarily the right ones. Well, <laughs> there, are, there are some restrictions on turning it into a perfect sort of seminar type occasion. You know, politics is politics. The House of Commons is not it's set up in a way that encourages erudite debate and careful reflection on the positions of, of uh, um, people on the other side of the chamber. But in the same way that injecting good quality research into the government process can have an impact, it can on the opposition parties as well, the other parties. And actually, I, I didn't mention when I uh, talked about uh, the, the report on the performance of multi-academy trusts and uh, academy chains that um, as well as having some influence, I think, on government policy thinking and on you know, the thinking of backbenchers on the conservative benches. I think it's also sort of been accepted by Labour policymakers, interestingly, uh, the evidence in this space. I mean, I've, I've attended meetings with uh, a Labour shadow uh, spokesperson and with some of the other key Labour people who really are interested in education policy who are on the select committee, for example. And they all, it's interesting that they also sort of take um, as fact both some of the analysis that Steve Machen and co. have done about the um, academies program. I mean, it may be easier for them because it shows the Labour program was more successful than the coalition one. Uh, but they sort of bank that and they, and they don't challenge the idea that, you know, some academy chains appear to do an amazingly good job. It's just that some local authorities do as well and some local authorities are rubbish and some maps don't appear to be very good either. Um, and that's useful because, you know, when we had a debate about this issue at a fringe meeting on education at the Labour conference last year, it was definitely in the minds of the Labour speakers, this issue about, about the, the academy programme having some benefits for some schools. That had seeped into their thinking about how they would behave if there was a Labour government and whether they would just throw the whole thing out and go back to a, a local authority run system. So you, you can't be overly, one can't be overly naive about everybody being sort of informed by uh, the evidence. And obviously, as Meg said, the evidence isn't always quite as simple as the evidence. There are, there are lots of things to look under. But eventually, it does sort of percolate through. Um, and it does inform the views of policymakers. I think Keynes had something to say about that, didn't he? About, you know, the views of policymakers eventually are informed by some... I'm not sure whether he said it was a rational, quantitative-based researcher, but some kind of scribbler who had written something uh, in an academic environment. So I think that's the hope. Thank you. Um, let's go to the front here. Thank you um, for a really interesting talk. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that Meg mentioned, and you obviously mentioned yourself, about um, education policy not being ideological. Um, I, I'm a teacher, so um, you obviously want to have um, research that informs your practice um, that works. Um, but my question is around, um, surely there is something ideological about what we choose to measure when it comes to research. So in your talk, you, you talked a lot about how we measure progress and attainment as a kind of good measure of whether something's working or not working. Um, but I work in a school that teaches an English mastery program um, where part of that, um, the students have to do two hours a week of direct grammar instruction where I have a script and they have a book and, I just, and they just repeat answers back and forth to me. Now, a random control trial has shown that that works for, for kind of improving um, student attainment, um, but it obviously has quite a lot of other consequences as well that aren't measured by progress in attainment. So, um, you know, whether that's 
teacher well-being, sense of autonomy, a student's feeling about their learning and things like that. Um, so my question is, should we not broaden what we're trying to measure and be quite honest about the fact that what we choose to measure is actually ideological? Yes. I'm not sure whether it's always ideological or not, but it certainly assumes um, that there is a common agreement and understanding about what the priorities are in an education system. And funnily enough, there's probably been quite a lot of consensus about that in England over the last 20 or so years. Different parties with different policy priorities have been very focused on improving outcomes for low attaining pupils, particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds. And interestingly, and in spite of a lot of the public commentary around this or the media commentary, there's been quite a lot of progress on that over the last uh, uh, 10, uh, 15 years, arguably because that has been the focus of things. Um, but what we don't know is what uh, impact that is having on other parts of the learning experience. We don't know whether we uh, you know, have a, a whole uh, future cohort of, of children who are brilliant at maths and English but desperately unhappy will never read a book, hate history, and so on and so forth. And um, I think that there's an underlying assumption that might or might not be right, that education systems should prioritize the basics first, get all the sort of maths and English stuff sorted out, and then work on the sort of whole human being. And it's interesting that many of the Asian systems that are uh, seen as very high performing in relation to English and maths and the basics are now looking at pushing the boundaries of what education looks like and often coming to this country to look for the exemplars, which are probably there in some schools, but it's not the mentality of the system. So we should always be sort of checking, firstly, that we are, that our ambitions are the right ones and that we're actually trying to focus research and evaluation on the right outcomes. You're, you're right to remind us of that because we could be making mistakes easily on that. And the other thing is, even if... Um, even if we all decide that what we want to improve is attainment outcomes in English and maths, you're right that there is a risk that what we teach and how we teach it and how we examine might give us the impression that we're creating um, a bunch of uh, students who are brilliant at maths and English and so forth. But it may simply be that they're good at passing examinations. And I think we were seriously in danger of, of getting into a system a few years ago, and some of this has been un unwound, but not all of it, where there was a sort of conspiracy amongst policymakers, schools, and everybody else to show that the system was getting better. And, so, and there was intense accountability. So there was a defaulting to doing things that would show progress and lead table performance, um, even at the expense of learning. And I remember being quite struck by meeting a bunch of Teach First teachers in 2009-10, the young people who had just gone into education, very aspirational and you know, wanting their children in generally poor schools to do better. But when I asked them what the thing was that they were most concerned about, and I expected a sort of modernizing but center-left view of how education should go, what they all said to me was, we're seeing far too many pupils who have been put through into qualifications that are good for school lead table performance but are rotten uh, career choices for those people and don't lead on to any progress. And that does show you the risks if you're ruthlessly focused uh, on things that then create distortions. So testing what you're trying to achieve and measure is incredibly important. Okay, thank you. Another question? We've had some people here at the front, maybe in, in the purple dress in the second row. Thank you, David. Um, I was interested that you brought EEF uh, up several times within your talk, and clearly uh, that what EEF do has quite an impact on what goes on in schools. Uh, and my interest is really in uh, thinking possibly about it from a, another perspective, and that is that um, the problem is if we have uniformity of practice, we may not have consistency of principle. And uh, increasingly, I see EEF and obviously the ones I pick out, the ones that I noticed from my own research, where uh, they've actually introduced something that really we've known for 20 years works in schools. And we don't really need to know if it works. We need to know how and why it works. So my question really is, what, what interest is there, if any, in practice-based evidence rather than evidence-based practice? 
with the government. I think you're right that you know the EF has been a good uh, innovation and it's doing some useful work in trying to indicate uh, what the cost effective interventions may be that deliver and don't deliver. But it can't necessarily solve all of the practical issues, including those around implementation. And we know from a lot of educational research that uh, a particular intervention delivered in a particular way in one school or set of schools won't necessarily have an impact elsewhere. Uh, and when the researchers look, for example, at the, the Liberian RCT after the first year, uh, they showed some pretty big impacts, but they also um, measured those against similar interventions with a lower cost and sort of implied that actually the value for money might therefore not be all that good. I, and they might be right, um, but the issue is that those other interventions which had phenomenally high rates of returns in the particular context in which they were being implemented might not have the same impact at all when rolled out to a large number of schools. And it could be the same for PSL type interventions. So I think the EEF is only a first uh, stepping stone in delivering good practice in schools. And it needs to, uh, the, the, the work that it can do needs to go hand in hand with uh, a wider focus on implementation rather than simply on practices that can automatically be rolled out in any school. And funding should go with that? To, yeah, I mean, the EEF, I don't think it's funding constrained at the moment. I think they've got um, quite uh, uh, good uh, levels of funding. So I think they need, as they think about how to go forward, they need to reflect on uh, what else there is they want to test. They need to reflect on those sorts of practical issues you were raising. And they also, I think, need to reflect on whether there are areas of uh, policy innovation that they've not so far been able to test because there isn't enough high quality stuff going on to look at, or they've not managed to incentivize providers to come forward to test particular propositions. I'm thinking particularly in terms of early years quality, uh, which is something I think that they're also interested in. Thank you, I suggest we'll have two more questions. Okay, there's a gentleman in the back there. That's right. Yes, back yourself, yes. The fifth row there in the white T-shirt. It's probably about 15 years ago now, or probably even longer, that primary schools had an objective of enjoy and achieve. We've had lots of evidence since then of achievement, but we've had little measurement of enjoyment, um, in the, certainly in the primary school experience. Um, and it seems to me that until we balance those uh, objectives so that we get back to the idea of inculcating the idea of love of learning and self-discovery, we're still going to turn out people who are good at exams but have no interest in discovery afterwards. Yeah, there is a risk of that. Um, although I don't think we can assume automatically that that is going to be the, the, um, the impact of a, a high accountability system. Sometimes a high accountability system might prod people into doing things in order to pass an exam, in order to get a qualification that might open up, some, open up an avenue that they would not otherwise have chosen to go down and given them an experience that might then uh, serve to be a jumping off point for other things. But you're right that there's a risk that, um, that schools only do the things that they're incentivized to do through the accountability system. And I think that we have to, I think therefore an interesting question, and one that Ofsted is looking at at the moment, is um, how can we ensure that those incentives merely to meet accountability targets don't bend out of shape the whole of the education system? Um, and one way of doing that is to try to add an infinite number of things to the list of things that inspectors look at so that they measure happiness, so that they ask how the child is feeling that day, so they see how many hours of support have been done and sex education and careers advice and guidance. That way, I think, lies the madness of, of measuring every single thing, turning schools totally into a factory and not doing anything that isn't laid down in the Ofsted handbook. The interesting thing is whether the process of sending in inspectors rather than simply looking at data allows some of those wider judgments and nudges to schools to do things that they're not driven to do by the 
uh, accountability tables to take place. In other words, you know, maybe having inspectors going in isn't just a, a process of checking data. But the tough thing about that, which Ofsted has got to think about, is it introduces a much uh, wider judgment about the curriculum, is can it agree with ministers what that broad and balanced curriculum offer looks like, and can it ensure consistency of inspection judgments? Because the inspection process, as we know, is very high stake. And if we simply leave it to individual inspectors to decide whether a school is happy, a curriculum is broad, uh, it could lead to a total lottery for, um, for uh, schools and for head teachers for whom this is very high stakes. But it's a good thing, I think, that we've got a chief inspector who has such a background in data in some ways, and of course in Ofqual, and seeing through Ofqual how an accountability system can bend an education system and education priorities out of shape, that this is one of her priorities as chief inspector, and I think it's a good thing that she's focusing on that. Okay, thank you. We'll take one final question, maybe in the front here. David can see me. A um, bit more of a contentious one, David. Um, so I read, I think two days ago or yesterday, you'd been talking to Schools Week, and when you were at the Department for Education, you'd talked to Michael Gove at the time and said, can we have Ofsted inspections of multi-academy trusts? And he'd said, no, I don't think there's anything we can learn. So two-part question, really. One is, do you think there is anything we can learn? I think I might know the answer to that. And two... Is there anything that they can learn? Is that your anything we can learn, yes. And then two is, do you think using your analogy of, say, a health secretary and education secretary, comparing the evidence that the education secretary should have the power to, one, forbid um, inspection of a really important uh, advancing area of the educational landscape, while also being able to tinker, I'm saying, speaking as a teacher now, almost like ministerial diktat into what is a worthy novel or not, because you wouldn't get a health secretary say, actually, I want you to do this type of heart bypass surgery because I think it's right. <laughs> Yes, on the latter, I, I do think that while it can be a bit naive to say, you know, politicians should get out of all these things and so forth, and, you know, the long discussion we had in government as to whether Mrs. Thatcher should be on the history curriculum uh, and eventually the compromise that she was there as the end of history, essentially, you know, the, <laughs> the last bit that you're allowed to study. She wasn't singled out, it just said history up to Mrs. Thatcher. Um, I really am very nervous about politicians uh, interfering to that extent, and I think it's fine to say, you know, we want all students to study the following subjects as core subjects, because I think who else is going to do that? And it is probably a political decision, inevitably. Um, but things, but once you get into the selecting bits of a curriculum and telling people exactly how to teach, uh, you're getting to a level of micromanagement that it, you know, it requires a kind of genius to be education secretary to ensure that that's going to go well. So thinking about, and other countries have done this, thinking about how to bound or limit mm. or slow down political power in these areas, I think is an entirely sensible thing to do. In some areas it may be removing it from politics altogether. In other areas it might require very long consultation processes rather than allowing decisions to be made at short notice. When we were looking at GCSE reform in the coalition, we were proposing to totally change the entire system at one stage within a couple of years for oh. millions of you know, students, massive risk and impact. We really shouldn't be doing those things uh, very, very rapidly. Um, the first part of your question was, sorry, uh, about um, oh, the mat inspections. Yeah, mat inspections. Yeah, I mean, funnily enough, the reason that we published this mat report came out of Michael Gove saying to me in a meeting where I said we must have Ofsted uh, able to inspect mats I, because they were inspecting local authorities at that time and finding the rubbish local authorities on school performance and I wanted them to be able to go into the weak mats. And his challenge to me, which I suspect was just an attempt to sort of stop the conversation, but his challenge was what would they learn from going into mats that they couldn't tell from the data? To which my response was, well, we don't have any proper data. You know, when we have some, they won't need to go in, arguably. And from that, this project started to try to look at a genuinely serious performance uh, data for maths, and that got published at the end of the coalition. It's very similar to the methodology that we are now taking forward as EPI. It does raise the interesting question about what 
a mass inspection now would add. Um, and at our, at our conference yesterday, the chief inspector was there, and she was making quite a, a, a clear pitch for inspecting mats, and I, I'd sort of missed this, but I think she's got the Secretary of State to leave the door open yet again to mat inspection. And her argument now wasn't so much that we needed uh, serious sort of data and understanding of mat performance, it was essentially that in the mats that are centrally run, the governance and leadership is from the mat level, not individual schools. So she was saying, why would I send my inspectors in to talk to governors and leaders who aren't really those who are driving and accountable for these schools? That raises other questions, such as whether you would have a mat judgment for all of the mat schools, which I, but not for individual schools, which I'd be actually quite worried about because the dispersion of school performance within mats is quite wide. And also, I'm not sure whether all mats do operate on the assumption that the centre determines everything. I mean, on paper it might look that way, but some maps um, in practice let all their individual schools do things quite separately. Some run a model and implement that um, uh, across the board. Uh, so I think it's less pressing now that we've got the types of data that, that, that the DfE are publishing and that we are publishing. I can see the case for those maps being inspected where they are essentially running all of their schools. But I think we've got to be very careful not to think that for parents, a, a judgment applied to a school group of 40 or 50 would easily replace the ability to judge individual schools because also in our report, we showed the spread of performance in individual maps and LAs. And some of the greatest maps have got terrible schools. Some of the terrible uh, maps in LAs have got fantastic schools. Parents are not interested in how the map's doing. They're interested in how their school's doing. Okay, thank you. I think we'll leave it here for questions, but um, I just want to thank you again, David, first of all, for the detailed and, and uh, full of talk that was full of food for thought for us but also for um, the time you've taken now to really engage with us and respond to our questions in the, the depth that you've done. So thank you very much for thank that. Thank you, I've enjoyed it.